taking their seat. Just a reminder, uh, two key events coming up, Camp Arete, which where they will leave on the 13th of July, a week from Saturday, to drive up to Arete. So pray for those who are traveling, pray for all of the last minute details that have to be brought together, and finances for everything. And then after that week is up, they return on the 21st, and on July 22nd or 24th, we have Vacation Bible School, and so I think there's still a need for helpers, but those who are, have children or know of children, are uh, you need to go to the website, to the westeasternbiblechurch.org website, and register, please. Also, one of these days when my schedule allows, I will get the final numbers, I'm this close, have the final information on the Greek Greece tour and Israel tour up on up on the website. I heard. I hope you had a great Independence Day celebration today. I know some of you had the opportunity to watch the things that were events in Washington D.C. this afternoon. Uh, and, you know, somebody asked me already if I watched it. I said, "Well, I had to decide on whether or not to get ready for tonight." <clears throat> or to watch that. So I think I made a wiser choice and got ready for tonight. So maybe I'll watch that on something else later on. <clears throat> Anyhow, I, I heard that it went quite well, and it's still going on quite well, and I'm sure they're doing a fabulous job. Anyway, tonight we're going to talk about our nation and issues that relate to each of us personally as believers and citizens of this nation. So before we begin, we need to make sure that we're in right relationship with the Lord, that we can focus on um, what we learn from the Scripture and application of the Scripture in this important area of our life, and that um, God will help us to understand maybe some things that we need to think through and come to understand in a better way about how we view our government. So we'll have a few moments of silent prayer to make sure we're in right relationship with the Lord, and if necessary, to confess sin in silent prayer. And then after a few minutes, I will, a few moments, I will, end, I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Father, tonight we come before you as we celebrate our nation's birthday uh, 243 years ago. Father, we pray that we would see a significant shift in the thinking of this nation. That is the only hope. The hope is not in politics. The no hope is not in political leaders. The hope is not in education. These are mere symptoms of the problem. The real problem is a spiritual problem, that this is a nation that has departed from its historic, biblical, Christian roots, and that as a result of that, they are adrift in terms of a foundation for their sense of freedom and independence, and therefore uh, the whole concept of liberty and justice and freedom are being redefined in terms of extremely pagan notions that are 180 degrees contrary to that of the uh, vision of the Founding Fathers and those principles that are set forth in our founding documents. And as a result, we have a much divided nation and we have tremendous conflicts. We have a nation that is uh, comprised of incredible amounts of anger and hostility toward one another. And Father, the only hope, the only solution is for people to return to that unifying foundation that marked our, our beginnings, which was on a Judeo-Christian foundation, an understanding of the truths of the Scripture, and a recognition of who we are as those who are creatures created in your image and likeness. And Father, we pray that you would continue to raise up leaders who have a solid foundation in understanding uh, the truth of Scripture, a solid foundation in understanding the history of this nation and who will not be swayed by, by pressure or by bullies or by uh, blackmail or whatever may seek to intimidate them uh, 
Father, we pray that you would raise up these kinds of leaders that will stand firm, will have in truth and integrity as the foundation and bulwark of their thinking, that we may preserve our freedoms, that we may continue to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ and teach your word in this nation and throughout the world. And we pray that you would help us to understand the issues that face us as individual citizens that challenge us, challenge our beliefs, that confront us with open hostility, that we may come to understand how we should live and how we should think about these things. In Christ's name, amen. Wanted to, tonight what I want to do is have an Independence Day special. I'm going to try not to make it a two-parter, but I have 14 pages of notes, so that may not be possible. But I think I can summarize most of it because it is, as we'll see, something that is important for us to understand and something for us to, to talk about. And right now I see a problem because, oh, there we go. There We have lights now. I want to talk about Thomas Jefferson, and I want to talk about him as the first in a series of studies, biographical studies on the Founding Fathers that we can have as specials at significant times such as the 4th of July or Constitution Day in September, other times uh, during the year to help us understand the Christian roots of our culture, of our founding documents, and that really is what made America great. Uh, America was not made gr great because of uh, secondary issues. The secondary issues related to economy, uh, related to uh, military, related to education, uh, related to industry, all of those were secondary. What was primary was what created the frame of reference, the mental attitude, that formed and shaped this nation, and that was derived from the Scripture, from, from the Bible. I want to begin addressing a question that's a very good question, important question, that is, why do we take the time to talk about history? Why do we take the time to talk about the history of this nation? Why do we take the time to talk about and focus on some of our founding fathers to understand the uh, foundation of this nation? And I, th I will explain that as we go along. First of all, I want to start with a passage in 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2. Paul is addressing Timothy, a pastor in Ephesus, under the Roman Empire, a time that was uh, not positive to Christianity. Christianity was viewed at this time still as a subset of, Ju uh, of Judaism. And it was... Uh, on the verge of being uh, persecuted. In 1 Timothy 2.1, Paul says, Therefore I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of, thank giving of thanks be made for all men, those who are our enemies, those who are our friends, for all men. For kings, then he explains this a little more, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. This is a passage that isn't talked about too much when it comes to developing a Christian worldview and addressing the issue of uh, a philosophy of government and a philosophy of law, but it is a vital one. What we are to pray for is that those in authority would leave us alone and give us the freedom to live out our spiritual life and fulfill the mandates of Scripture, that is, to proclaim the gospel and to freely teach everything that the Bible teaches without fear of government interference. If you were to go outside and look at your yard after some of the rain we've been having lately, and it's all overgrown, then you say, my goodness, that yard needs to be cut. I need to go read my Bible, and I will pray about it. And if you did not, after you read your Bible and prayed about it, go get the lawn mower out of the garage and start it, or call someone to come cut your grass, then you would just sit there and do nothing. You're praying for something, and it's within your power to at least do something to fulfill, get the answer to that prayer fulfilled. We all know that that would be ridiculous, a ridiculous scenario to pray that God would have my grass cut today and then not get up and do something about it. 
The same is true here. That when we pray for kings, for presidents, for governments, for all who are in authority, so that we can lead a quiet and peaceable life, then that entails us doing that which we can to ensure that. And in a nation where we have the vote, where it is a, a republic, where we elect representatives and send them to um, the uh, city hall or to the capital of our state or to the capital of the nation, then that is part of our responsibility. It doesn't just involve prayer and passivity, but it involves getting uh, getting involved in the process because as citizens of this nation we have an inherent responsibility to vote, to vote wisely, to be involved in the process, and to vote intelligently. So that's part of it. As we celebrate on this 4th of July in 2019 the birth of our nation and, the, and we honor the day that the final wording of the Declaration of Independence was approved by the Continental Congress. It had been passed on July 2nd, but on the 4th they approved the final wording, and it was probably signed by John Hancock and by Charles Thompson, the secretary, but nobody else signed it on that day. That document's been lost, so we don't really know, because it went to the printer, and then from there... Uh, it was lost, and it wasn't until August the 2nd that they convened, and most of the members of, of the Continental Congress signed on that day. There were a few who had gone home already. There were a few that weren't available, so they didn't sign right away. The Declaration of Independence came about because on about, a, about three or four weeks earlier, on June 11th, 1776, the Continental Congress appointed a committee of five, consisting of John Adams of Massachusetts, Thomas Jefferson of Virginia, Benjamin Franklin of Pennsylvania, Robert R. Livingston of New York, and Roger Sherman of Connecticut to draft a Declaration of Independence. Because the committee did not leave any minutes and there's no records of who contributed what, we can't say for sure who wrote what or who, was in, who influenced which statements or ideas. However, the... A uh, committee delegated the responsibility of writing the first draft to Jefferson. And he wrote most of it, and according to his testimony years later, he did not consult anyone else. He wrote from that which he understood to be the thinking and the heart attitude of the American people at that time. We don't know how much of this language was his uh, original language was his wording, but we assume that most of it was uh, a, a very closely reflected uh, his thinking as well as the thinking of the other four. Jefferson is significant not simply because he wrote the Declaration of Independence, but also because later he served as Secretary of State under our first president, George Washington. He was a vice president under the second president, uh, John Adams, and then he was the third president who served two terms. He is also significant because of his role as governor of the colony of Virginia, later the state of Virginia, following the Declaration of Independence, and, and because of legislation that he initiated and saw passed while he was governor of Virginia. When we look at this legislative body of, of data, uh, or this body of laws that he promoted and passed, we see a completely different picture of his view of the role of religion in a culture than that which we have been brainwashed with in our culture today. And so I think it's important that we examine these things because it's important that we understand what the truth is. We can know the truth. You can look at history and understand the truth. And we have numerous records and personal uh, writings that guide and direct us. So Jefferson is significant to study because he wrote the Declaration, which is what we're celebrating today, gave birth to our nation. But because uh, of his intellectual stature and his influence among the founding fathers, his writings regarding liberty and freedom, uh, of, and, uh, freedom of religion in Virginia during the founding era was significant as well as a phrase that he used in a private letter 
to a group of Baptists in Danbury, Connecticut, where he used the phrase, wall of separation, which has been co-opted by the judiciary in this century to describe something he did not intend. So we need to look at these things and understand them. Uh, as believers, we need to understand these, all of these issues. We recognize, number one, that history is God's plan that works itself out. This, we don't know what God's plan for tomorrow is, but on Saturday we will know and it will be history. And so by studying history, as it has been said, we study his story. And only those who hold to a biblical view, a biblical worldview, have a true sense of history. When you and I went to school, we were probably taught, I was taught, you were probably taught that the father of history was a Greek by the name of Herodotus. Herodotus, unfortunately, lived about a thousand years after Moses, who was the real father of history. He wrote Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy, which gave a history of the origin of the Jewish people. History is God's plan worked out in our, in our lives. So we need to understand those historical issues in our own culture because they are impacting court decisions today. They have taken away uh, freedom from Christians to live out and to practice their faith, and they are under daily attack in the courts. Now, when we come to talk about politics, there are some people who say that politics, there's no place for politics in the pulpit. Well, I would say there's no place for liberal politics in the pulpit, which unfortunately is what we usually get because for some reason, conservatives had, have, adapted a, have adopted a rather passive view about speaking about politics. They are afraid of the Johnson Amendment uh, back in the 50s that threatened uh, 501c3 status. But if you understand what the law actually says, the church as an entity, as a body, cannot uh, get involved in politics. But the pastor has freedom guaranteed by the First Amendment to say whatever he wants to say from the pulpit. It's a freedom of speech issue, a First Amendment issue, and uh, the only thing that is prohibited is for the church to make an official statement as a body of the church. In fact, the only time nonprofit status has been taken away from a church was for one day back in the election in 19, I believe it was in 92, it may have been in 96, but it was presidential election when uh, Bill Clinton was running for president and a church in a small town in Kentucky took out a full page ad in the local paper that said, do not vote for Bill Clinton, he is the devil. So the IRS, after much adjudication, took away their nonprofit status for a 24-hour period. That's the only time it's ever been, been lost. That was just an official statement that was made by the church. And so that's what caused, caused the problems, not because of anything said from the pulpit uh, by the pastor. Why should we talk about politics? The term politics comes from the Greek word polis, which talks about a city. And in Greece, they were rather small. And it talks about how a group of people organized together as a polis would govern themselves. And so this relates to how individuals relate to other individuals within a city or within a nation. That is part of the social application of scripture. So politics talks about how people organize themselves for governance. That immediately involves values and ethics and principles for the social and civil organization and the standards that govern how they're going to do that. That is what the Bible teaches us. All through the scripture, there are numerous statements related to government and related to how a uh, king should rule, and how citizens should respond to the authority of a king. Government is described in Scripture as being established in the Noahic Covenant, which is described in Genesis chapter 9, uh, verses 1 through 9. And in those passages, there's the delegation of judicial authority uh, 
uh, to the human race for uh, the for for laws and judicial actions related to the punishment of those who commit uh, murder. The fact that they were to punish or take the life of a murderer indicates that or implies that there is a process, there is adjudication, there must be laws to determine differences between uh, different kinds of murder, accidental homicide uh, versus uh, intentional premeditated murder. And so that is the biblical foundation for government, the divine institution number four. While the Bible is not a textbook on geography, it says a lot about geography. While it's not a textbook on history, it says a lot about history. While it is not a textbook on politics, it says a tremendous amount about politics. And as such, we as believers need to understand these principles. Look at a few passages. Matthew twenty-two twenty-one. Pharisees came to Jesus and said, uh, said, who should we pay? Should we pay taxes to Caesar? And he took a coin and he said, whose image is this on the coin? And they said to him, Caesar's. And he said to them, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God. There are a lot of things that we can say about this. First of all, Jesus recognizes that they are to submit to the authority of the rulers in the area of taxes. And they were to pay the taxes and he also recognizes there is a distinction between the obedience given to the secular government, the civil government, let's say, and obedience given to God. And that obedience given to God is superior and overrides any demands or commands from the civil government. In Romans 13, 1 through 4, we're told that we are, as Christians, to be subject to the governing authorities, that all authority... Uh, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. It also prohibits resisting the authority and the ordinances of God and the ordinances of the government, and that the government is God's minister to you for good, down in verse 4. Titus 3, 1 and 2, remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. So we see that, that throughout Scripture there's this emphasis on our obedience to the rulers. Also in 1 Peter 2, 13 through 15, Therefore submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish foolish men. So what we have here is a range of passages teaching in the scripture that we are to be involved in government. We are to be obedient, we are to be submissive, and that there is a, therefore an, we must ask the question, well when and if is there a time or place where we should um, be disobedient to government? All of those are issues that I'm not addressing tonight. Now, in the founding era of this nation, if you have read anything about it, you have probably not been told much about uh, how involved pastors were in the war for independence. The British believed that the churches needed to be destroyed because it was the uh, Black Robe Brigade, which is what they, the term they used to describe the pastors, that were their greatest enemy, that the pastors understood the biblical principles of freedom and liberty, and that the pastors got in their pulpits every Sunday, and that a large degree of the content of their messages related to political issues. They talked about government, they talked about politics, they talked about taxation, they talked about the limits of government and the rights of man. This was common if it were not for the pastors preaching in the period from 1740 to 1776, we would still be speaking the Queen's English and under the authority of the Queen of England. And that is because the pastors were teaching how to apply biblical principles to their thinking in relation to government and in relation to 
all of these other areas and the freedom and liberty of man. During this time, we had a uh, period referred to as the Great Awakening. Awakening. It was the first Great Awakening, and it was a time period when Thomas Jefferson was born and came to maturity, reached adulthood. He heard sermons just about every Sunday in the Anglican churches where he, his parents attended, and so it was in, the, in this time period of the Great Awakening that he would have uh, been impressed with a lot of this kind of teaching. It would have helped to form and shape his views on, on the world. And when he, was, um, uh, when he was a young man, uh, this, was, uh, this was very much a part of his particular life, which we'll get into in, in just a minute. After the War for Independence, after the problems with the Articles of Confederation, once the Constitution was approved of and went into action, we had uh, the first president was President Washington, followed by his vice president, John Adams. And then John Adams ran for re-election in 1800, and Jefferson ran against him. Adams represented the Federalist Party, which t generally tended towards a stronger government and a less rigid interpretation of the Constitution. The anti-federalists had a more rigid interpretation of the Constitution and wanted l more limited government. That was represented, that was represented uh, by, by Jefferson. Many scholars opine that this was the most vicious malignant election in the history of this country. If you read the things that were written in the press about each of these candidates from the opposing party, you would think that both of them had the horns of the Antichrist and the forked tail of the devil, and they uh, sought to destroy this country. It was in that election that the the pastors of the North. Now, you have to understand what's going on religiously. In the North, all of these different denominations, all these states had, um, had denominations that were established. So all of the denominations got their money from the taxes of the people. And so it's a money thing. Always follow the money. They did not want Jefferson to be president because Jefferson did not believe in having the states with having established, uh, established denominations that were state-supported. He believed in uh, voluntary Christianity. He was not, and, and so many of the things that he said that he's quoted as saying is being hostile to Christianity or hostile to the clergy uh, were, were written uh, at this time. I mean, these, these calumnies, these slanders against Jefferson uh, go back to that time period, and they get dredged up every now and then, repeated over and over again uh, by those who just want to uh, denigrate uh, uh, Jefferson and run down Jefferson. Now, I'm not here to defend everything Jefferson said and did. That's not the point. Our point is to honestly and accurately investigate him and understand uh, more about this particular complex individual. Jefferson was charged in that 1800 election with being an atheist. He was charged with being a deist, a demon, anti-American. He was a, subsur a subversive. He was immoral. Uh, he was a racist. He had fathered uh, children by one of his young slaves. And all of those things were said over and over again in the press so that many people believed them. But none of those charges were proven then or now. But they continue to surface to serve the same nefarious agenda of those who really want to uh, develop an extremely strong uh, government at the expense of individual and individual liberty. Now, the first time I really read a book on Jefferson was a book that was written by Fawn Brody and came out in the early 70s called Jefferson, An Intimate Portrait. And I didn't know anything about her, but as I read it, I started having, you know, my radar would go off. And there were things that she said, ah, I'm not so sure, and I questioned, and things like that. 
And I, that was the first time I ran across the whole question of Jefferson having an affair with one of his young slaves. She was probably 14 or 15 at the time. It would have lasted over a period of a decade or more, and that he fathered several children from her. Over the course of time, I read a lot more about Jefferson. I've read him. I have a book here that I brought from home called Founding Fathers, The Revolutionary Generation by Joseph J. Ellis. He's just as nasty and bad and wrong as Fawn Brody was. In fact, we'll get into this later, but Brody wrote, later wrote a book on, on um, Sally Hemings, and she wrote a book on... Sally Hemings was the uh, young black slave that allegedly Jefferson um, fathered several children by. And then also, um, uh, you know, and Ellis affirms the same thing in his writings. He wrote another book called American Sphinx, which is a biography of, of Jefferson. And so you keep hearing these things. This is what the establishment says about Jefferson. I, I have my undergraduate degree in history. That's the kind of thing I heard both in college. I'd heard it to some degree in high school. But I heard other, other, under, other ideas about Jefferson that caused me to, to wonder, question. And over the years, I've read a, a, a lot about, about Jefferson, about the Founding Fathers, and their particular background. A couple of years ago, another book uh, came out written by David Barton. David Barton's a Christian. He's done a tremendous amount of work on the history of Christianity during the Founding Era. It's called The Jefferson Lies. And uh, so a little bit of what I'm saying tonight is kind of a book review of that of that book, but reflecting some of the things he says there. It came out in the first edition, apparently, according to his introduction. Came out um, first edition, and he was just blasted by everybody who holds to these traditional anti-Jefferson views. It's interesting, Jefferson is blasted by, from both the left and the far right, and it's all based on a lot of this, uh, this false information that we have. And so, uh, in this book, he writes something on the order of, it's in Roman numerals, so I have to really think about this, but he's got about a 47-page uh, preface, and he's responding, this is a second edition, the paperback edition, and he's responding to uh, his critics who blasted him, and so all he does is thank them because they made his case stronger, because he had to dig in his heels. He has a staff. When I first read Barton in the early 90s, I was not impressed. I was sympathetic to a lot of things he said, but in my opinion, as a, I did my historical, I mean, I did my doctoral work in church history, and he just didn't document things. He made a lot of claims that nobody else made, and they weren't documented well. And I understand how difficult it is if you're just uh, doing everything on your own with no staff and no money, that it's difficult to get to a lot of original documentation that at that time in the early 90s is housed somewhere like the University of Virginia or the Library of Congress or someplace like that. But over the years, uh, he has done. He has always fought back against his critics. His his scholarship has improved. He has a staff, according to this book, of eight research assistants. Uh, I've met a couple of them over the years, and they all have degrees in history. And he has probably one of the largest private collections of original founding documents in this country, and they're buried in a vault somewhere. He, he's done his homework. And so what he did after he got blasted by uh, several people, he went back and he documented every jot and tittle of what he said. And what I like about it is he, in, in many, many places, he gives the, the, uh, the URL on the Internet where you can go to that original documentation and find it. And you got to remember, in 91 or 92, when he wrote his first book, there was, there was a bit baby internet. It was barely functional. And you didn't have this plethora of, of sources and archives. And people weren't putting all these original documents from the 
founders and to everybody else up on the internet so you could research all this stuff from the comfort of your own home. All of that is possible now. So he's just done a remarkable work. Uh, there are some issues I have with his theology in places. There's some issues I have with some other things. But he does a good job of documenting the claims that he makes about, uh, about Jefferson and about others. So we live today in an era when uh, education on these historical political matters is lacking. Most of us in this room were brainwashed with a very, uh, very erroneous and uh, agenda-driven view of history. Yet nobody identified they had this liberal agenda view. And I'll tell you right up front, I look at history as God's history. I come from a Christian background. I believe that history and historical documents should be interpreted the same way I interpret the instructions on the tax code. Literal, historical uh, interpretation, grammatical interpretation. And that's the same way that you should interpret the founding fathers and the founding documents. It has to be contextual. And that's why tonight we're going to spend a lot of time just thinking, talking about Jefferson. Because when you come to the 1948 ruling where Hugo Black uh, turned the historic uh, interpretation of the uh, First Amendment on its ear, he just yanks a phrase out of a private letter from Jefferson to a group of Baptists in Connecticut. And he doesn't do any contextualizing in history. He doesn't look at how that phrase was used for numerous centuries prior to Jefferson's use of it, does no historical background, and just plucks out of the thin air of his imagination a completely unique interpretation of the First Amendment. And so it's important to contextualize these things. So as we talk about this, part of this is an application of Scripture. We need to understand how our biblical, theological worldview is, uh, addresses these important issues in our culture. They are Matters that affect us every single day in many ways that we're not even aware of. So we have to understand how our, under, how our biblical worldview un, uh, interprets and understands what's going on in our government and what is going on with various uh, uh, legislation. So I hope that as we go forward over the future years that we'll hit different founding, founding fathers and understand understand their their framework. Okay, first of all, what's the need for this study? Jefferson is attacked from the left and from the right. From the left, they accuse him of being racist. If they had had a Me Too movement in the early uh, uh, 1800s, they would have uh, attacked Jefferson. Uh, they accuse him uh, of being a philanderer, a womanizer, uh, he owned slaves, so he uh, was a slave owner, and they try to uh, completely delegitimize him. Fawn Brody, who I mentioned a minute ago when she wrote her early 70s biography on, on, um, on Jefferson, I ha didn't know it at the time, I suspected it a little bit as I read it, but she's a radical feminist, and she had her agenda and what was happening, as we look back on this, is in coming out of the 60s, there was this revolt against authority. And so what was happening from the left is they were reinterpreting the lives and, uh, and, and beliefs of our founding fathers in order to destroy their, their, the perception of their integrity and their knowledge and their wisdom and to delegitimize them. Typical leftist ass assault of using ad hominem arguments, that if you can prove that so-and-so was uh, had an affair with his slave, then that means nothing he said or nothing he did should be listened to. And that is a logical fallacy. But people listen to that because they don't know the facts and they don't, they don't study the facts. 
Uh, not only has Jefferson been attacked from the left, he's been attacked from the right. There is a uh, John Birch Society uh, video out there on called Facts and Myths that uh, David Barton has taken apart piece by piece because they attack Jefferson as an anti-American and a, a complete enemy of America. And they believe the same lies that the left does. So at some point, the far right and the far left all believe the same lies. Uh, that's not true necessarily in everything, but it is true in this particular case. Second thing we're going to look at is Jefferson's life. What do we learn about his beliefs and his thinking from his life? And then third, we'll look at three specific problems that most people ask about or believe because that's what they were taught. And the first is that Jefferson had an affair with a young slave girl who was in her early teens and that uh, she got pregnant, had at least two children by him, and when he was uh, ambassador to France, that uh, she was brought over and he impregnated her, and on the way back she comes home and she's pregnant and has her first child, none of which is true. Uh, but this is to claim that he's a womanizer, a racist, and everything vile that fe feminists despise. Uh, second claim is that Jefferson hated Christianity. He was uh, said to be a deist, an atheist. He hated Christianity. He hated Christians. He hated pastors. And he wanted to have a, a nation that was purely secular. That's the third thing we're looking at, is that he really desired a purely secular state where all religious belief and religions were cordoned off and isolated from having any impact in the culture. At least that's the way he's presented or has been presented by the left until now he's fallen out of favor even among the left because of these other charges. So the bottom line here is that we need to study the founding fathers. This whole thing about uh, knowledge about their lives, their beliefs, and the impact of those beliefs on what they wrote is, is being denigrated today. I mean, as I started to work on this, I said, why is this even important? You know, sort of like Hillary Clinton. What does it matter now? Nobody cares. I mean, you care, I care, but more than half of the population in our country could care less what the, they're just old white men. Who cares what they said? Who cares what they believe? You know, it's, there's this large segment that just wants to throw out whatever uh, practices we've had for 200 years because, well, we live in a different world now. So we have to look at this and we have to understand that, that there was incredible stability here. So let's just begin to talk a little bit about Jefferson's life. Jefferson was born in April the 3rd, 1743. He died July 4th, 1826. Same day John Adams died. Interesting that they both died on July 4th. But he's born in 1743. Now, what's going on in our country in 1743? Well, we're still 20 years away from any kind of reaction uh, against British control. It wasn't as intense at that time. But there is a religious movement taking place in this country that was phenomenal. It was, I believe, a genuine revival, a genuine spiritual renewal that was energized by the teaching and the preaching of the Word of God. Men like Jonathan Edwards, uh, men like, like um, uh, Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield, and in the South, in Virginia, you had men like... Uh, uh, Jared Devereux and Francis Asbury, who founded and shaped the American Methodist Church. These men rode up and down uh, the trails, went from church to church. It didn't matter what denomination. If they were, if they were Anglican, they would be welcomed, at, or they would be welcomed at a Presbyterian church. And the word of God went forth, and there was a massive response to the word of God and. Thousands upon thousands, tens of thousands turned to Jesus Christ and the Scripture as the only hope for their lives. And then they studied it, and the pastors taught about it. In fact, it was um, Patrick Henry's pastor from whom he learned how to speak. He learned oratory because he from this, this pastor, and he learned the gospel and was saved, and he learned the truth of God's word. And that was true for many of the 
uh, founding fathers and those that we revere for their impact on this country. So when we talk about Jefferson's life, he's born in 1743, which is near the beginning of the, of the first Great Awakening, which began in the late 1730s and extended into the 1760s. So in 1760 was when he went off to William and Mary to uh, college. So he is reared in this environment, the church environment, of the first great awakening where there is such great biblical biblical preaching. In um, his later life, he lived through the second great awakening. And there, in my opinion, there was a lot of good that came out of the first great awakening, not as much out of the second great awakening. There was a lot of legalism and a lot of evil, a lot of heresy and a lot of cults, Mormonism, and uh, Church of Christ, not Church, Church of Christ scientists, and others came out of that 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 uh, Second Great Awakening. A lot of heresy, a shift to Unitarianism, away from Trinitarianism, and a shift to more of a work salvation. So it was a real mixed bag, and there was a rise of a lot of emotional religion and revivalism that took place in the 1820s and 1830s. Uh, most of that happened on the frontier in Tennessee, in uh, Ohio, River Valley, in Kentucky, those places. Not as much. That which took place on the Atlantic seaboard was much more stable and historical and biblically, uh, biblically correct. But all of this influenced and had an impact on Jefferson's thinking. Jefferson more than likely held fairly solid, orthodox, biblical beliefs. I don't know if he's saved or not, only God knows, uh, in his early life. He questions things about God through a period later on in life. Uh, Barton puts forth and defends a thesis that this is very likely the result of the fact that uh, his wife Martha dies in 1782 and he is, according to all testimonies and witnesses at the time, just absolutely almost paralyzed by grief. And we all know people who go through traumatic loss in this life. I found out about a friend of mine uh, I grew up with, going to church, went to college with, that just, um, uh, I, I hadn't heard from him in a long time. Last time I talked to him, he was on the skid spiritually, and I really didn't have any reason to talk to him again. But I thought, I wonder what happened to him. Found out that within a year or so of the last time I talked to him, he had developed early onset Alzheimer's, and he died five years ago. So his, he, he was clearly a believer. I knew him through the ups of his adolescent years when he was going to Bible class with me every Wednesday night. In fact, his mother drove us to uh, teen class. And later on, when he uh, cleaned up his life from a lot of drug abuse and other things and found a wonderful woman who loved the Lord, and he had gotten very involved in a couple of ministries and had returned to the Lord for a period of about 20 years. And then life just didn't turn out the way he wanted it to. He, had a, he was miserable at his job. He had this problem and that problem. And life wasn't what he thought. God didn't give him the things he thought God should give him, and he turned against God. We've all seen people like that. So probably in the later years, uh, after he go, Jefferson lost his wife, you see a shift in his thinking about God. He seems to come back to a more orthodox view in uh, the early 1800s, but we don't really know what his uh, ultimate spiritual condition was. Um, Barton's not sure that he was saved, but Barton tends to be a little lordship. And so I tend to think on the basis of some of his writings that he uh, was probably, very likely he was saved from his upbringing, but who knows. Um, for the first 15 years of his life, until 1758, he attended the St. James Anglican Church of Northam Parish with his family. The church was pastored by the Reverend William Douglas, and it had a school which... Jefferson attended for six years. 
Then the family moved to Albemarle County and attended the Fredericks Fredericksville Parish Anglican Church, which was pastored by a Reverend James Murray from 1758 to 1760 and attended Murray School there, where he was taught all of the doctrines and beliefs of the Anglican Church, as well as uh, history and logic and many other things. Uh, Murray was an advocate of what is known as Scottish common sense realism. Most people that you read, even Barton speaks, I think, wrongly in this way, not specifically enough, that you read, talk, will just treat the Enlightenment as if it's homogenous, that if there's all one thing and they'll say so-and-so is influenced by the Enlightenment. Well, there were different branches of the Enlightenment. There was the Scottish Enlightenment, which was known as Scottish common sense realism. Here are four basic tenets of Scottish common sense realism. This is the Scottish Enlightenment. Number one, they believe that there is a God. Number two, they believe that God placed into every individual a conscience, a moral sense written on his or her heart. Third, they believe that God established first principles in areas such as law, government, education, politics, and economics. And these first or transcendent guiding principles could be discovered by the use of common sense, logic, and reason. And fourth, they did not believe there was a conflict between reason and revelation. Nearly all of the founding fathers were taught within the framework of Scottish common sense, uh, Scottish common sense, uh, realism. So that was his background, that was his training, and then after he uh, finished school, he went to uh, college at William and Mary, and all of these schools had uh, a lot of biblical and theological training as part of their curriculum. He was never influenced by the radical enlightenment of the French. Notice there's a distinction. The French radical enlightenment is not the same as the Scottish common sense. And there were, there's a, a moderate enlightenment that you have, the German enlightenment. There's three or four different uh, schools that are described as part of the Enlightenment. So it's important to distinguish those things. Many in European Enlightenment thinkers were not radical. Uh, the French Montesquieu, the British John Locke, the Scottish Thomas Reed, and uh, William Blackstone were strongly influenced by the Bible and were all born-again believers. Uh, Jefferson, as a matter of fact, rejected the skepticism of, of David Hume. And so during this period where he goes to William and Mary in the early part of the 1760s, until the Declaration of Independence, he is still involved in church. In 1768, he became a vestryman in his local Anglican church. That is a leader in his church, and as such, the Anglican church at that time, like all denominations, was still biblical, orthodox, solid, and text-based. So liberalism doesn't affect anything for another 75 years. It is still biblically sound, and so as a vestryman, he had to uh, uh, swear to his belief that he would conform to the doctrines and discipline of the Church of England, and so that is somewhat positive in terms of his spiritual life. Uh, he was friends with some of the great uh, uh, awakening preachers like Deborah Jarrett, and the Great Awakening revivals had a tremendous impact on the churches at that time. In 1772, he married Martha Wales Skelton, who was a devoted believer. And so this also indicates that he is not antagonistic to Christianity or to Christians or to clergy. He was a brilliant man. He was well-read. He was very complex in his thinking which grew and expanded and transitioned over the, over the years. It's often claimed that Jefferson was a deist, but there's no evidence of that at all. He's also often said to be an atheist, but there's no evidence of that at all. In the Declaration of Independence, we read these statements that 
When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth a separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. Okay, those terms sound a little foreign to us, but that's how they wrote then. He believes in a God who is not only a creator God, but is involved in his creation. That is not deism, that is not atheism. He then goes on to say, uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. I just love that statement. It, the government just recognizes that we have these rights. They are inherent to us. About 10 years ago, I was at a gun show, and I picked up a T-shirt, a couple of them. And I love what's written on the back. It says, liberals evolved from monkeys. Constitutionalists were endowed by their creator. I love it. We therefore the representative, this is at the end of the declaration, he says, we therefore the representatives of the United States of America in general Congress assembled appealing to the supreme judge of the world. The supreme judge of the world, this is not an uninvolved, in, in deism God's pictured as a watchmaker. He builds the watch, he winds it up, throws it out there and goes away and does something else and is completely uninterested and uninvolved in the watch. Okay, this is not a deist kind of God. This is a God who is the supreme judge of the world to whom we will all be answerable. And then he says, and for the support of this declaration with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. That is not an uninterested, absent landlord, deist God, and it's certainly not atheism. Now, some years, or some months after writing the Declaration of Independence, he prepared a speech to go before the legislature in Virginia to argue for the disestablishment of the Anglican Church. Now, most of the colonies had an established denomination. If you were in Virginia, it was Anglicanism. If you were in Pennsylvania, it was the Quakers. If you were in Connecticut, it was Congregationalism. If you were in Maryland, it was the Roman Catholic Church. And that established denomination was funded by taxpayer money. Jefferson was totally against it. He wasn't against Christianity. He was against it being supported by taxpayer money. So he put together a speech where he was arguing before the legislature that they should disestablish the Anglican Church. In his notes, which have been published, in his notes for that speech, he writes these two things. He says, the fundamental of Christianity, he abbreviates that X-T-Y. Now, I remember when I was a little kid, my mother said, I wish people wouldn't use Xmas. The X has been an abbreviation for Christ since at least the second century. It is the first letter in the word Christ. It, it's the key in the Greek alphabet. And that's what he's doing here. I, you go back, look at my handwritten scribble all my notes in seminary before it was BC, before computers. I had an X, I put a key for Christ and a key and a Y for Christianity because I wrote those words all the time. That was a simple way to do it. So this is no disrespect. This is, these are his notes. The fundamental of Christianity is found in the Gospels are number one, faith, number two, repentance. That faith is everywhere explained to be a belief that Jesus was the Messiah who had been promised. Did you hear what he writes there? He says that faith, that is Christianity, is everywhere explained to be a belief that Jesus was the Messiah who had been promised. Repentance was to be proved by good works. So his understandings of the Lordship, but it's orthodox in a broader sense. Then later he writes, the fundamentals of Christianity were to be found in the preaching of our Savior. Notice the pronoun of our Savior, which is related to the Gospels. The Apostles' Creed was by them taken to contain all things necessary to salvation and consequently to a communion. Does that mean he had a personal faith in Christ as Savior? I don't know. Neither do you. 
But it's not the writings of a deist. It's, and this is in 1776, three or four months after the writing of the Declaration of Independence. So, I wanted to talk about these three fake claims. Claim number one, Jefferson fathered children by a young slave girl, Sally Hemings, and therefore is a racist, womanizer, abuser of women, etc. That is the modern liberal uh, narrative. And many of you probably, if I were to say, how many of you think he fathered a child, would raise your hand and say yes. Uh, this has been a rumor about Jefferson since Jefferson was alive. And in 1998, there was a journal article that came out in the in science in the uh, in the science journal, and it said we have definitive proof, according to DNA analysis, that Jefferson fathered Sally Hemings' children. That made all the news shows. It made the evening news with Dan Rather and with Tom Brokaw and everybody else. It made all the morning shows, the good morning shows. Guess what was going on at that time? January 1998. Anybody remember? What was William Jefferson Clinton doing? He was trying to avoid being uh, found guilty of, of an impeachment in the issue of lying about having sexual relations with that woman. So, if you can come out and say that Thomas Jefferson was just as naughty and he's so great, then what's the big deal with William Jefferson Clinton? So that was what was happening there. It was all political. You got to know the context. And eight weeks later, Science Journal had to come out and retract everything they said. But that did not make the front page of any newspapers. It didn't make the morning talk shows. It didn't make the night talk shows. It didn't make the news. N nobody heard about the retraction, and they had to retract ev everything that they had, they had said. DNA has to be tracked to get paternity from the father. Jefferson had only one son, and he did not have progeny. He died young, and so there's no male line no, no line that has a descendant from Jefferson's son. They had uh, taken DNA from an uncle, and so at best, all that they could demonstrate was that one of possibly 30 different Jefferson men could have been the father. What they did disprove, which was ignored in the initial report, was that, um, was that the first son, which... Uh, Sally was allegedly pregnant with when she came back from France could not have been Jefferson's son. So they ruled him out. And the bottom line is after several uh, commissions and several other, uh, other uh, investigative groups that they came to the conclusion that uh, in fact there's one uh, scholars commission from the University of Kentucky and I mean, and uh, that that uh, state they, that representatives from University of Virginia, University of North Carolina, University of Kentucky, Indiana University, and they were this commission to study all this. And their conclusion was there are at least ten possible fathers for Sally Hemings' children who could have passed down genetic material that might produce children physically resembling Thomas Jefferson and who are thought to have visited Monticello regularly during the years Sally Hemings was having uh, children. Another commission that came out said, according to the genetic evidence, the father could have been Jefferson or could have been his brother Randolph or one of Randolph's sons or presumably his uncle Field or his son George or one of his sons. Any of these men had access to Monticello and could have been, uh, could have been capable. So anyway, Barton goes through a host of information and a host of detail to demonstrate that, and there are numerous uh, commissions came to the conclusion that it was impossible for Jefferson to have been the father of any of them. So this was all uh, just, uh, just a lie to destroy his reputation at the time that he was, was alive. 
So we see that it's disproven by DNA. It's probably his younger brother because the time that she got pregnant seemed to fit within a period of time but where his son, his brother, younger brother was not married. His wife had died. He's a widower. He's lonely. And this took place during that period of time. Second claim is that Jefferson hated Christianity and Christians. And part of the evidence for this is that Jefferson had his own Bible. How many of you have heard this? I've said this from the pulpit. I was wrong. I got corrected on this. Um, and it was that Jefferson took the New Testament, he took out his razor blade, and he cut out a lot of verses, and he put things together so that he had his own Bible, and it excluded everything supernatural, all miracles, things of that nature. Uh, but there were actually two Bibles that he put together. One was in 1804, and another one was in 1828. They, you have to ask the question, why did he do this? What was his purpose? Well, in the 1804 Bible, what he did was he created an abridged version of the Bible. His purpose was to create a Bible that could be printed, published, translated, and distributed among the Indians. And so rather than having the repetitions of the Synoptic Gospels, he went through and he picked key events in the life of Jesus where he did things and taught things, and then he uh, pasted that together so that there would be an understanding of who Jesus was and what his teaching was. We have Bibles like this today that are synoptic Bibles and parallel texts and abridged Bibles and things of that nature that make it simple for some people to get a grasp of what the Bible is saying. It's not being done to cut out the Word of God. It's being done to create a simplified text so that people who are newbies can read it and get the big picture. When I was a senior in college, I bought an abridged New Testament based on the Living Bible, read it from cover to cover, and went, now I understand the framework of the Old Testament. It was great. I wasn't reading it for doctrine or teaching or anything like that. I was reading it to understand what the framework was so I could put all of, all of the details together. In the 1820 edition, he witnessed a rise in, the in immorality in the nation. And he went on an investigation, read, read and searched through all of the ethical writings in history that he knew about, the Greeks and the Romans and, and uh, Enlightenment thinkers. And he said that the writing, the teaching of Jesus was far superior to anything that they had written. And so what he did was he went through and he created a parallel Bible, English, Latin, and French, of all of the ethical statements that, of Jesus for the purpose of teaching, or for his own personal purpose, of reading through all of the things Jesus said so he would be reminded of, his, of what his ethics should be. It was not an attempt to remove miracles or the supernatural. In fact, in the 1804 edition, there were a lot of miracles. Uh, Jesus healed people. Jesus cast out demons. Uh, there was a heaven. There were angels. All of that is present in the 1804 edition. The 1820 edition was not known for a long time, and then it was rediscovered and published in 1904 as an encouragement to ethical living. And yet people took it to mean, oh, he cut out all the Bible. That wasn't his, wasn't his, his purpose. He didn't hate the Bible. In fact, he, he invested in the publication at, of several Bibles uh, in his, in, over the years so that they would ha the printers would have the money to be able to print the Bibles and publish them. That was, that was a called subscription. You subscribed, and you're basically investing in these printers. Today we would call it a pre-publication investment. Logos does this all the time. They want to publish something, and they want to make sure they have enough people who are going to buy the end product, so you get to uh, pony up your money and give them your credit card ahead of time, and if they think they have enough people who are going to pay for the product when it's done, then they go and they do the work to convert it into electronic text. This was what they were doing. Jefferson also was responsible uh, for legislation 
that would send missionaries to the Indians. He was responsible for legislation also that took taxpayer money for other things. One of the most interesting things is what happens in terms of of the church that met in the Capitol building. Now, I am seven and a half pages into my, into my notes. I have not hit the third one yet, which is the important one. That's church and state. And I have 12 and a half pages of notes. So I still have four and a half pages of notes to go through. I don't think I can synthesize all of that. So we'll come back and talk about the wall of separation and finish this up next Thursday night. Father, thank you for this opportunity to go through these things, to understand that your word had a tremendous impact on our, our founding fathers. And the two that are typically used as examples of deists and atheists, uh, Franklin and, and uh, Jefferson, were, were probably far from that. Uh, we don't know if they were actually saved at any point in time, but they were not what is often claimed. And Father, we recognize that just as in our culture you have a lot of believers who think like unbelievers, at that time you had a lot of unbelievers who thought like believers because they were surrounded by such a Judeo-Christian culture. And so they they wrote these documents. They, They had tremendous wisdom, and as a result of that wisdom we have the freedoms and liberty that we do. And when that foundation of Judeo Christianity is removed, then the edifice of our liberty and freedom will not stand. So, Father, our only hope is in a restoration to your word and the truth of your word. And we pray that you would raise up men and women, teach the word, who will tell one another, tell others the gospel, and that we will see a a genuine return to the scriptures in our country. It's happened before. And we just pray that it will happen again. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.